Good morning and welcome to the last day of Words and Music. We're really excited to be starting out this morning with the life and legend of Bra Coupe. Before we get rolling though, I would like to welcome up Pamela Blackman, who is with the Preservation Hall Foundation. They're sponsoring the session and she's gonna tell you a little bit about what they do. Hello everyone, good morning. Thank you for having us here. Um, as Megan mentioned, I'm Pamela Blackman with the Preservation Hall Foundation. I am over the programs with the foundation and it is a delight to be here this morning as um, words and music goes perfectly in line with Preservation Hall Foundation's mission to protect, preserve, and perpetuate New Orleans music and culture. And so the foundation is powered by donations that allow us to do some beautiful things in the community, community engagement like this, um, archives, um, education, and our legacy program. And uh, being able to open for Brian and Sun Pai with this wonderful uh, discussion on Bra Coupe is wonderfully tied to our mission connected with protect preserve, perpetuate, within the oral history uh, part of New Orleans culture. Um, we see the face of New Orleans uh, changing so much, and because our neighborhoods don't look the same, because people have been displaced, that beautiful gem of New Orleans culture, oral history, we see that changing a bit. And uh, through these programs, through the working alongside masters like Brian and Sun Pai, we're able to keep things uh, to the source a little bit better. And um, we have so many legends that are living right now. And if you think about the landscape of New Orleans, within the next 10, 20, 30 years, we'll have so many more stories to tell. So. I think that it goes without saying that our words matter, um, history matters, how we tell things uh, definitely matters. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting uh, Words and Music Festival. Thank you for supporting Preservation Hall Foundation. If you don't know um, much about us, please do look us up. Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, thanks, um, thanks, Megan, for making this happen. Um, maybe I'll talk first for a little while, and then and then sure. we can talk, and we can all talk together. Um, so I'm going to be showing some slides. So maybe that you want to turn that way, so you can see the slides. I'm just going to go through pretty quickly um, uh, what the book is about. Um, the book is um, about um, uh, someone um, named Brock Coupe. Um, he's um, uh, he's a, a fugitive slave or maroon um, in the, the swamp upside uh, upside the city. His um, his his name in French means um, severed arm. Um, so Brock arm um, Coupe um, is um, cut. Um, so um, I feel like he needs to be better known in New Orleans. So this is actually why I, I, I made this book. I wanted I wanted people to know more about him. Um, so first, um, uh, let's see, um, I'm going to use two historical maps to quickly orient you. This is the Ogden map, this is 1828. So you can see here, it's nice, you can see the relationship between the city and the swamp, right? So before the invention of the wood screw pump, you know, they've got all that swamp land back there. Um, this is the Pinstree map of 1841, gonna, I'm going to use it to show you some places in um, the city. Um, so. Um, Again, it's important to know, you know, the relationship between the city and swamp. Um, you know, Bruce thought about this a lot. Um, is is really important at the time. You have maroon communities that are out there pretty much from when the city is founded. You know, so these are city. Uh, these are um, communities of people who are mostly um, uh, fugitive slaves. Um, they have agriculture. They are reproducing over generations. They are hunting and fishing and trading and making crafts. They're coming into the city to you know work a day's work and, and get provisions and go back out. Um, you can think a little bit about the analogy of, um, you know, undocumented migrants now. You know, like by law, they're not supposed to be in the city, but they're absolutely essential to the economy and society, right? Pretty much for a long time, it's it, it can be like, like a peaceful relationship between the city and the swamp. Um, sometimes it gets um, it gets hot, and you know this. Is 
It's a story about, um, about that in a lot of ways. Um, so, Frappe then was one of, the, one of the famous Maroons in the history um, of um, New Orleans. Um, so, um, uh, let's see. I'm going I'm to show you a few things in the beginning just to orient you. He's enslaved by a man named William Devise. Um, this is the Devise family in Crest. This is um, where the Dubai's residence was on St. Louis Street between Bourbon and Dauphine. So like next time you're at um, the Cat's Meow, you can go look at the building, it's actually it's there. Um, this is the cotton factory where he would bind together, um, you know, cotton that had been ginned for the market. So this is owned by William Dubies. This is, we're pretty sure, Squire or Bracoupe was working there. Um, this is kind of Marini Bywater. Um, this is where um, a, a sawmill owned by Dubies was. Um, we, we believe that Squire or Rock Pay also worked here. And that's the, um, the, the second Dubies residence in the city right by the, um, the sawmill. Um, so, um, we don't really know that much about Brock um, until 1835. Um, it's the police records that start to tell us what he's up to. He's arrested for playing in the streets in 1835 and, and brought back to the Debye's residence. So we know at that point he's not yet a Maroon. In 1836, though, it's really important, he's, he is arrested. He's shot in the arm. This is, he has two arms before this moment, Squire does. He's shot in the arm. He's brought to Charity Hospital. Um, uh, he's treated well because he is enslaved by a prominent person. Um, and so they, they, they cauterize the wound, they're, they're, they're taking care of him. Um, the police who are looking over him um, uh, kind of uh, go and take a break, and he jumps out of the second story window of Charity Hospital and returns to the swamp. And from this point on, kind of declares war on slavery. You know, he starts raiding the city, things get really hot, and he's leading this, this band. I'm going to show you just a few documents. Um, this is the police record um, where, um, you know, it, 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 it's, his wound is described. You can see here his name, Squire. You can see a variant spelling of Dubai's. Um, this is where Charity Hospital was at the time. That's now Tulane Avenue, you know, um, but it's, it was called Common Street at the time. So that's where he jumps out of the window and returns to the swamp. Um, now, um, uh, so, so this is important. He gets his name. Bracoupe from an injury he suffers at the hands of the police. Okay, um, and it's really important because um, the reason why he becomes so famous actually has a lot to do with city politics and the politics of the police in the city at that moment. Because um, as Bruce knows it's 1836 in January, they take the guns away from the New Orleans Police Department. Right, there is a reform campaign to demilitarize the police that is successful. Right. Um, let me give you an example. Of, this is the kind of rhetoric that you got in the newspapers. Are we not sufficiently enlightened? Have we not sufficient energy and decision of character in our present city government to cast off this offending <coughs> remnant of barbarism, annihilate this remaining leaven of ancient despotic custom and inherited prejudice, to dispense with the sword and pistol, the musket and bayonet, in our civil administration of Republican laws? Right? Wow. Yeah. And this succeeded. Right. And so the thing, though, is Mayor Dennis Prayer didn't like this. You know, he has a patronage relationship with the police. They want their guns. Right. And so one of the things he, he, he starts giving speeches saying that no, we need to have our guns. But a crucial thing that he does is that he makes Bras Coupe through a propaganda campaign and manhunt into a kind of super villain. Right. Uh, he, he announces a six thousand dollar reward for Bras Coupe dead or alive put up wanted posters or you know, articles in the newspaper. And so it really is crucial that really the reason why he, there are a lot of Maroons in the city. The thing that makes him famous is that he's the target of a police manhunt designed to defend the police's right to deadly force in the course of duty. Right? So this is an intense and important part of um, the story. Um, so, the, so after, um, so 1836, you know, he escapes back out. He then is at large and having a career through until the um, uh, summer of 1837. So this is the map from the book, and you can see the different numbers here. These are various incidents that I'll, I'll, I'll skip, but they're kind of adventures that are followed. Everyone in the city is talking about him, right? It's serious. It's serious. Uh, in Ju uh, July of 1837, um, he finally, um, he, his life ends. He's double-crossed by this person named Francisco Garcia. Um, who is a kind of uh, middleman who's working between the Maroons and, and selling things. He wants the reward. 
So he um, he takes a crowbar and he um, he he kills uh, he kills Squire or Bracoupe and brings his body to Dennis Prier, the mayor's office in the Cabildo, and says, you know, give me my reward. He thought the reward was sixty thousand dollars, so he was disappointed to realize it was only, <laughs> only six thousand dollars. But um and um. And then, um, so I'll just let me show you some of this. So that's actually the treasurers from the third municipality. You can see there Francisco Garcia and Squire in the payment. Um, after this happens, um, Dennis Prier has um, Bracupe hung in effigy in, um, uh, in the Place d'Armes. So this is obviously now Jackson Square. You can see the Cabildo, the mayor's office. And um, for a week, um, the, the legend has it, um, his body was hung here as a kind of warning. It was said that people who were enslaved in the city were ordered to pass by, you know, um, uh, you know, as a kind of warning. So he is a, um, he's a, he has a, a bloody and um, difficult end. Um, he then becomes um, a legend. Oh, I should say there, there's really interesting newspaper coverage. This is New Orleans Picayune. Um, this is New Orleans B. Um, he's covered in the abolitionist press, you know, so like the, um, the Liberator, this is the um, uh, a paper called Human Rights, it's published out of New York, and so for the abolitionists, he's, he's a hero, right? So in, in the Picayune, he's a villain, for the, for the abolitionist press, he's a hero. Um, he gets, you know, this amazing oral tradition, uh, people like Lafcadio Hearn, Louis Moreau Gottschalk, Henry Castellanos um, tell it versions of the story. So he gets superpowers, you know, like he can like breathe fire. Um, you know, if you look at him, a lot of people talk about if, you, if he looks at you, um, he can turn you to stone. Um, there's a story that I really like where um, he's being chased by some police and they like turn a corner and they're in a kind of dust storm and then they find themselves in India. You know, it's like, I, lo I, love, all, I love all of this stuff. You know, like all, the oral tradition is amazing. Yeah, 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 exactly. So um, you, you then get um, a, the first work of fiction about Barack Hussein, 1856. Louis Armand Garot publishes this in a French feuilleton newspaper. He writes it though. Do you know this? He writes it in J the building that becomes J and M. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And so it's which is crazy. So yeah, it's he's right across from Congo Square, but it comes Kasumu Matasa's first studio. So like literally. I don't, I don't know what to do with that exactly, you know, but like the place where the first fiction about Barack Coupe was written is also where Bats Domino reported the fat man and, you know, Little Richard reported Tutti Frutti. I, it's, it's an amazing it new world. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Washington. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of that. All that. So that's the first work, work of fiction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accelerate a little bit. That's, that's the place that becomes J&M Studios, same building um, where he actually writes it when he's a school teacher here at Garo. Um, the big work is um, this, this novel, The Grand Scenes, and it makes big changes to the legend that then influence how the legend is remembered after that point. Um, so I'm going to go quickly through the five changes that Cable makes. Um, first, um, he backdates the legend from the 1830s to the 1790s, so it's colonial times. There's a lot to say about the implications of that change. Um, he eliminates the maroons and the police, so Bracupe goes to the swamp, in you know um, in in the novel, but the maroons the, he's a loner. Maroons aren't there. Um, he uh, invents a backstory where Bracupe is an African prince. There's a lot to say about that. Um, uh, and then crucially here, I'm going to give you a hint for the fourth change. What do you do? You, does anyone notice anything about this image? Yes. Um, I'm, yeah, yeah. That's right. He's got two. He's got two arms. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so this is a, this is kind of a, an amazing thing. He, uh, Cable puts his puts his arms, you know, back on. Um, so he restores the the missing the missing arm, um, which is like what you would, if his name is Brock Pepe, you would think that would be the one thing you couldn't do, right? You know, this is actually a manuscript in Tulane Special Collections where Cable says exactly that. He's like, people got mad at me because they were like, this is the one thing you can't change. But you know, he did it. There's a long story about how he, how he did that. One last thing, which is the most important thing, which is that um, he centers Prakupe at Congo Square. Okay, so this is the first time it happens, it happens in the novel. Um, so you can see you know, his, his residence on St. Louis Street and Congo Square, they're close to each other. Um, Cable also writes um, the most important kind of historical essay, influential historical essay about Congo Square. He doesn't mention Prakupe in this essay. Right? Right? This is a, a fictional idea that um, Prakupe is the most famous dancer and most famous drummer at Congo Square. Um, uh, this is an illustration from the essay. Sometimes I've seen books that say that this is an image of Brock Coupe, which is, which is, but it's not. You know, this is, in, in, if you look in the essay, it's, you know, it's just called the Bambula. Um, Brock Coupe is not mentioned in the essay. So there are interest, there's interesting 
um, things going on there. Um, so, um, so after Cable writes that novel, almost all the material that happens is influenced in various ways by his fiction. Okay, so you get poems, for instance. Um, you get um, a, a lot of um, kind of in tourist guidebooks, versions of the legend that mix together the novel with oral tradition. Um, you get a, an opera. There's an opera that's performed in um, uh, uh, England and um, France. Um, um, and then importantly, Herbert Asbury in 1836 publishes, you know, um, a history that is a mix of fact and fiction. And um, very influentially, um, I'm not going to read this, but the first thing you can see it says about him is that he's one of the famous Bambula dancers of the early days. Um, and then talks about William de Bees and other kinds of things in the police. Um, this is important because if you look at the earliest um, histories of jazz, they all work from Herbert Asbury, right? And they mention Bra Coupe. They don't mention him by name. They mention someone who precisely, as, it, as it's quoted by Asbury, says badum badum and is one of, you know, all of the language from that passage appears. One person even says, they get the dates wrong, they say that he directly inspired Buddy Bolden. That Buddy Bolden heard this nameless central dancer mm -hmm. at Congo Square and it inspired you know, his, his style of playing, which is amazing, right? You know, um, not entirely true, but amazing you know, um, as a way of thinking about these things. Um, so then you get later, um, you know, like Gumbo Yaya, um, uh, you know, later versions of the legend. This is a very cool short story by Andrew Golden, um, who worked at Grambling for a long time, um, called Tiger of the Bayous. Um, Robert Penn Warren, in his novel Band of Angels, adapts the Bra Coupe story. Um, it becomes part of a movie, um, a, like would-be Technicolor blockbuster um, with uh, Clark Gable, um, where um, Sidney Poitier plays Bra Coupe. Uh, note with two arms. Um, it's not a great movie, unfortunately. I wish it were a better movie, but it's still, it's still interesting. Um, so then, my favorite version of the legend um, appears in Sidney Bechet's um, As Told Two Autobiography, um, where he takes many versions of the legend um, and combines them to tell the story of his grandfather. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's helpful to read um, Bechet's autobiography next to the definitive biography by John Chilton, where he, he kind of unpacks the Omar legend, um, which is a legend that derives in, in, in large part from the, the history I've been telling you. It's kind of amazing. Bache says, you know, my grandfather invented jazz. He invented jazz at Congo Square. He tells that part of the, the story, but then he also tells the story about being in the swamp, the Maroons, the, the, the life of the community, um, and the police. Um, it's really a remarkably lyrical and powerful um, the ways in which he turns these parts of the stories into a kind of um, a mythology of the origins of jazz that insist upon the importance of understanding the music within the social circumstances of slavery in the city. So then, just quickly, um, there are other people, Marcus Christian, Tom Dent, Aisha Rahman, um, Kalamu Yasalam, who, who, who um, use Bracoupe in, in their writing. Um, and also, I, I want to mention um, Demont Melançon, whose um, suit, Brock suit in 2016, was just an extraordinary work of art. Um, he was um, very generous in um, allowing us to use um, the breastplate from that work on the cover. So that's the cover of the book, is actually it's bead work um, done by Demon Melançon, um, who is um, the big chief of Young Samuel Hunters. All right, so I'll stop there. Um, there's lots more to talk about. I'm curious what Bruce, Bruce has to say. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you dropped it. Like it's hot, so to speak. <laughs> um, uh, you know, this is a, a deep and wild trove into New Orleans. And I guess I would say, first, just one comment. If it weren't for Marie Laveau in the past years, everybody would have mugs and t shirts, and uh, swamp tours would be a billion dollar industry. Just to try and imagine and go to places that Brock Coupe uh, ran to. But um, my first thought is the atmosphere and the uh, living conditions in New Orleans. Like, what was the terrain for someone enslaved like Brock Coupe? He's, in a, he's, he's enslaved in the urban setting. Uh, and kind of what informs him about desire to uh, to be free, first of all, 
and to take the, a step to go into, you know, into the wilds of the city. There's, there's a, seems to be a, a triple psychology in New Orleans about how dangerous it is to go into the swamps if you're urbanite mm -hmm. in the first place. Uh, and then, like what this terrain is between um, white folks, black folks who are enslaved and those that are in the in-between. There's a lot of in-between zones that go into New Orleans, which I think makes it possible for this to exist. So, so if you can kind of like maybe comment on like what this 1835 downtown setting is, is kind of composed of. That's, um, yeah, that's such a great question, um, because a lot of the time, you know, when, um, when we think about the situation of, of, um, of slavery, we think about, you know, like a plantation. You know, we, you know we, we, there, there are certain kinds of images that we, we get in our mind from films, from, you know, from literature and kinds of things. You're, I mean, it's really important that the situation in a city, is, as Bruce is saying, is really different, right? You know, so this means that um, you actually have a, a different Kind of flexibility, you know, in in um, in, in going around. Um, a lot of the time, you know, you're not working um, in a field. You're, a lot of the time, you're being hired out, you know, or you're working you're working at that cotton factory or you're working at that sawmill, and so you've got then, um, you know, a, di a different degree of it's not freedom, but you've got a different degree of flexibility in your life. You often have a pass, you know, that enables you to do things. Pretty easy to fake a pass, we know, you know, um, and so. Um, uh, you know, we know that you know there was a lot of kind of back and forth between the swamp and the city because people had a little bit of flexibility in their lives. They also, you know, could go to Congo Square on Sunday and gather. You know, right. there was something that in a lot of other situations you wouldn't have the ability to, um, you know, kind of practice your traditions and you know sell your wares and mingle. You know, in, in that kind of setting. So it was, you know, it, it was a it was a an, an interesting um, and, and different. Um, and obviously difficult um, that situation um, that um, that they were in. Um, but so that, that's I guess that, that's the first way I would think about it. You know that it's, it's a little bit different from how a lot of our preconceptions might be. Right. Yeah. This is not gone with the wind in terms of like how things are set up. So um, just uh, you, what you're saying, like uh, petit marinage and things like that. That's right. What's, you should we, you should say we should tell them what that is. Yeah, so this is a, a situation where you could take leave <laughs> if you wanted to, if you were enslaved, and uh, for a short period of time, a few days. The understanding was if you had your pass mm -hmm. uh, and or fake ID, mm -hmm. nothing new under the sun. You know, uh, Ecclesiastics tells us that there is nothing new under the sun. So. You could you could take a short leave and and roam around the city, go out the city, go and handle your business. And the understanding was you would come back unless you uh, had corn marionage, which was like you left and you were just you said the hell with it, I ain't coming back. Uh, then people were gonna come looking for you, of course. And uh, you know you didn't really have to go that far. Twenty five miles was a long way into the wilderness. Uh, so that's a system that was very common here and it's, it's well known and practiced uh, in both directions. So you could do a lot of things that also helped you gain your, your freedom. You know, by law still, uh, I think New Orleans is probably working on a, uh, at least four different systems. It still has an old French system, an old Spanish system, a new American system, and then it has this system of the people who live in the wilderness, and they're all functioning, and they, and they clash often. And it's, you know, kind of tied in. Yeah. So, so plowing through city records, what is that like? And yeah. To uh, try and piece this puzzle together. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. It was. It was. It was. You know, interesting. And you know, and, and there were some things I couldn't. You know in the end do. Like I really wanted to figure out when he arrived here, you know, like whether he was born here, whether he was born somewhere else. I looked, you know, at very closely at the conveyance records and other things, the people who were used by the Device family, and I, co I couldn't find that out in the end. So, you know, so there's some things, you know, you go and do the research and you've got the question and you can't find a good answer for it. 
you know. Um, there are other things when they started to be pieced together um, uh, that I was just amazed, you know, um, for instance, the, the kind of coincidence and then connection between the police campaign and the Brock Pay legend. You know, when that started to come together, it was, um, it was, it was really extraordinary. Um, I should say too, this relates to the question, like what, what, what is city life like? What was city life like for enslaved people in the 1830s? Um, that, you know, the city was wild and crazy, right? So in terms of the police campaign, one thing you notice that's really clear is that they could have come up with any number of reasons why it would have been a good idea for the police to have guns, right? Right. I mean, it was a, it was a river town, you know, there were all kinds of, you know, river workers who were like spilling off, all kinds of craziness is happening all the time. You could come up with a, any number of reasons. The reason, and, and prayer is very specific about this, the reason is slavery. He says, mm -hmm. look, they've got guns in Charleston. We have to be like them. At that time, if you're in New York, you're in Boston, you're in Philadelphia, the, gun, the police don't have guns. So they're, that's, they're trying to be like the, you know, the Yankee people by, by taking the guns away. Freer says, no, look, you know, places that have slavery, police have to have guns, right? That's what he chooses. And so there's a way in which he loses that battle, right? You know, New Orleans police don't have guns for several years. Right. And they're actually crazy articles where they're like, you know, I went to Mississippi and like the police were running around shooting their guns off all night. They're such barbarians in Mississippi. You know, it's kind of amazing. This <laughs> but there's a way in which Superior so loses that battle, right? You know, he's not able to get the arms back immediately, but maybe in other ways he won the war in the sense that he invented this kind of justification, right, for police to have guns that seems to have had massive historical you know, impact over time. So, yeah, that's that's one piece of it too. Like how, how that fits yeah. into the story of the city at that time, and the research for that was um, that was that was where I did feel like I was able to find an answer. Yeah, it all seems downhill, and and uh, you know, other curious questions are like, what would his approximate age have been at that time? Yeah. Uh, he's a superhero, so he doesn't really have an <laughs> exact age. But if you jump out a, a second story window. Um, hit the ground running and disappears for like yeah. buku months. Mm -hmm. You're a bad month. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, uh, and it also um, um, kind of is the desire for, for to truly be free and I've had enough, and um, which is a, a, a arc of um, spirit in New Orleans, and it's, it's, there's a lot of it here, and it's unusual in the amount of it, uh, and how it really couldn't be contained. In yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that distinction you make um, between um, Petit and Grand Marinage is like so important too, because it's like, we often think about when someone decides to strike out for freedom, we think about Frederick Douglass, or we think about you know these, mm -hmm. these, these slave narratives where you kind of leave everything behind for good, and you go far away. You know, yep. the, the kind of when you think about this petit petit marrons, you know, there is this different kind of thing where you have you have a little bit of you were talk, talking about it as like an interzone or something, you know, where mm -hmm. where you can actually you you go away for a few weeks maybe. Like there's a there's a, a different story. It's not like the kind of going away for good, yep. all, all you know all the time. And, and we I would assume that Squire spent some spent some weekends away on leave, you know, before he made the decision to leave for good. Yeah, you know? I'm thinking he's testing it. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, filling it out. Yeah, but so it's like a kind of that. It's just a different story and a different flexibility with regard to that that kind of desire that, that, that I think you're describing. Yeah. Right, and, and it seems to me that um, since uh, the mayor is adamant about having uh, heavy arms and and reasoning, you know, it, it kind of brings up the the image of uh, OJ on his run. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to, and, and from that, there's another downhill movement of how well armed law enforcement is going to be. Mm -hmm. They got helicopters. They have, they've got a lot of stuff. But, but it makes towns all over the, the country mm -hmm. uh, start to get military gear. Yeah. yeah. They have straight up tactical military gear on up to some places having tanks. Mm -hmm. That's how wild and crazy it, it's been. But in the case of Broad Coupe. Uh, Doing this, he's he's also in the same era, I guess, as uh, Nat Turner. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Uh, like Absolutely. It's, it's, all this stuff is happening in multiple places, yeah. and uh, the fear. So, um, any good stories on um, Rock who paid a boogeyman? Mm. Yeah, yeah. What is the? Yeah, there, yeah, there are there are a bunch of good ones. There's a great in um, there's a newspaper in 
Washita, um, where there's a great um, set of stories about him being a boogeyman, where people talk about when they would go and play by the Carondelet Canal, like picking blackberries, mm -hmm. they would say to their friends, Brock Coupe, I just saw Brock Coupe, and then everyone would kind of scatter. You know, so there, <laughs> so you get, um, you definitely get those kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, Gottschalk also tells that story. He, he talks about how um, a woman who was taking care of him when he was young would tell him the stories about Brock Coupe as a kind of boogeyman, you know, this kind of figure who, you know, um, specter who would come and scare you. Yeah, yeah. Um, do, we, do we want to open up for, I don't know what time it is. Do we want to open up for questions? What do you uh, think? Yeah, after one more yeah, yeah, question yeah. around <laughs> the uh, movement of, um, since all of this happens and it's a, it becomes a phenomenon. It's, a, it's also a, a problem. Um, can you comment on the, the medical condition of someone mm -hmm. who would do this, like the invention of trachomania? Right, right, right. Yeah. It, it becomes a, a thing. Yeah. Or it becomes, yeah, it becomes medicalized. That's right, exactly. There's um, a condition, I'm trying to remember the, the guys in Cartwright, I think, is the person who. Um, who kind of names that condition, which is, um, so people wanting to run away from their enslavement are, are said to be so, in some way wrong in the head, right? You know, and so it's, it's given a name and studied as a kind of medical right. condition. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a medical condition that uh, only black folks have. <laughs> and it's mostly men, and it has like four or five different tiers of what it is and what the treatment is. So it's a, a medical paper that's delivered. It also comes in the same time when um, what races of people are is defined scientifically and mm -hmm. intelligence and what to do with it. And it still exists very strongly in some religious movements <laughs> in, in this country and, um, and is the backbone of a lot of things. But I just remember the term when I was a kid, my father was born uh, in 1909. And, and when somebody would do some wild, crazy <laughs> shit in the neighborhood, they would laugh about it because they knew somebody was getting ready to like defy the system that they were under. And he was a man that went to prison twice mm -hmm. for um, um, not having a pass mm -hmm. in the 1920s and 30s, mm -hmm. uh, moving around town from uh, like a, a plantation, or raised up on plantations and. Uh, but they would say, why? He they'd say, oh, John had drink the mania when he did that shit. That's what it was. It was like, and it, you know, because it was like, you know, and you know, sometimes they'd feel it coming on themselves when they were, you know, like they'd had enough of the work conditions and the things that were going on uh, with them. And it, you know, the, the things that came out of that was the invention of, of course, the plantation prison system. Yeah. That's the reaction that happens in, in this state and around the South. Two short questions. Can you say runways to the swamp? Where exactly is that? Are you talking about the West Bank? Or are you, where are you talking about exactly? And the second question is, is there one Brock Coupe? Or when you talk about the explorers, were there several people doing, uh, helping them? Uh, These are great questions. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to get the picture of the city with the swamp back up here. Um, so we're talking about, um, you know, up, up by the lake, basically. So that, that's actually good, you know. So, um, you know, a, 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 by, you know, um, all, all the way up there, the city is just a small part down here. You know, really kind of, really just goes a little bit into like what, what's Treme now, and then um, everything up there is um, is swamp. There's an amazing article published by a woman who was a maroon who came back, um, who re-entered the city, and then told the whole story about where they were living. Um, in this place she called the Trembling Prairie. She talked about how they were disguising, you know, their um, their places. Often, you know, I think living on, you can walk up and down on the side of the bayous, you know, so like the Bayou Mentory system and stuff. A lot of people are up there. Um, uh, Brock Coupe spends a lot of time around Bayou St. John. He's the best where he's eventually, um, where he's eventually killed, and he has a couple kind of skirmishes up there. Um, also, Bayou Cochon, which we don't really know where it is. It's up there on the map in the, the right part. There's um, an incident there. Um, uh, that um, is, is really important. We know he was there. It's but so in terms of like so yes. So he had a group of people with him. But I also would say it's pretty much inevitable that um, a lot of things were happening around town and they were getting blamed on Brock Coupe. He might have had nothing to do with them, right? But a crime happens and it's convenient to say, look, the supervillain has done this crime. So I think a lot of things that are attributed to him actually probably have nothing to do with him. 
Um, he does, though, have, um, he's often described as having a band with him. So when he would come in and raid the city and declare war on slavery, you know, he, he definitely had other, other maroons with him um, when that was happening. Yeah, I think a few of those names pop up there in his company of, you know, a uh, few names uh, of people that were with him that were prominent somehow. And I think Mike Cochon is kind of out toward New Orleans East. There's some old poems and, and riddles about Bayou Cochon also in Creole. So, which is like, you know, if you're running away, they would say, and they still use it in Creole. Lakuli Maroon, he's gonna, he's gonna do some, it's like Drake to Mania, about to do some wild crazy shit and they're gonna run away, you know, so it means that you're gonna do some out, something so outrageous that after you do it, you got to run. So it's like a connotation and thought process. Mm -hmm. Help me with the timeline again. Um, you know, when he started being prominent when he jumped out of the window. That's Jan yeah. 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 The January 1836. Okay. So, and so he's, and when he, he jumped out. That's when he jumps out, January 1836. And then he got whacked, really? Um, at, at Jan uh, July 1837. Yeah. About, about a year and he a half. He didn't have a whole long period. Of no, but 18 months to be at large, you know, when you're, when you're actively, you know, kind of at war with the cities. Uh, Pretty good run, you know. But yeah, I'd say it's not a, it's not a, it's not a huge amount of time. Um, but you know, his his legend kind of persists to this day, you know. So it's um, there there are ways in which both the history, but also the meaning uh, of you know that he takes on as a kind of mythic figure in the city are, are both like I think really powerful and important. And then the shooting in the arm that happened. Why that's why he was in charity. That's why he was in charity. He was shot in the arm by the police. Um, de definitely. Um, you know, um, that, that, that book is a lot about the development of police institutions in the 19th century um, and the ways in which um, they, they are, they are, they're built on slavery and, and, and emerge in the aftermath of slavery. And I'm very interested. I, I wear different hats um, in my job. Like one hat is like I'm thinking about the wild chop tools and, and things like that. Another hat is I, I teach in the law school sometimes at Berkeley. And so I, the first book is really much more, it's, it's like a legal history book thinking about the principle we call the police power, you know, um, and, you know, going, going way back and um, the ways in which um, that principle is interestingly insulated from any kind of constitutional scrutiny. Um, and, it, and it is precisely that principle that authorizes things like the right to deadly force in the course of duty for police officers. So that principle is, is, is what is at stake here. So it, you're, I mean, it's very closely connected, that first book and um, this material. up every time. It's always pushed back by city council and people who want to be in office. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know if it comes up every time. I mean, people come up but just like as a national conversation, that there's been precedent that this has happened before. I guess that's the part that I haven't heard yeah. so much. It seems like a, a new idea. Oh, taking away guns? Yeah. But it's an old idea. It is old. Yeah, I mean that's why I read, that's why I made the book, you know, is to get people to talk about, you know, that's the um, best best way I knew to um, to do that. But I agree, it's really important. It is also complicated, though. The people who want to take the guns out of the police are not anti-slavery, right? right? History is complicated. Yeah, you know, it's business. They, for yeah, them. they're it, just looking at Boston and New York. And yeah, what these are. You know, so so it, it is it is a precedent, right? Um, for for police reform, um, it's a complicated precedent. But I think on all sides, both sides of the debate. You know, the people who are take, taking the guns away, the, the ways in which, you know, people like Dennis Preer were arguing for the necessity 
of a, a state monopoly on violence is also really informative and important for us today. So um, yeah, I think that, that that stuff is really important. Go ahead. Did Brock Lupe have a lover? Yeah. And all these stories he seems this is asexualized, a, and I'm just yeah. every villain I know has sex appeal, right? Yeah. And yeah. All these stories, yeah. right? I mean, no, he has. Uh, you, I mean, some of those images, he has, he has massive, massive sex appeal, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you want, do you want to take this one? Well, you know, he's, he's John Shaft. Uh, you know, so he, he and then you know, uh, Cable's story is the one that that uh, romanticizes it and everyone else follows suit. It doesn't happen in the first writings, really, so much of who he is. He's just, you know, the Frenchmen just try to present him as, mostly as he was, but changing some things around. He becomes a prince. I mean, this is like, Cable is writing. He's competing with all of the other romantic stories that come out of the Wild West at the mm -hmm. time. So people are reading in Harper's, or they're reading in all these different digests and newspapers, these romantic stories of faraway places. It's for an audience on the East Coast, really. Um, Boston, New York, where there's a big clientele, and people romanticize that stuff, so he turns them into a prince. Uh, he says that Brock Coupe is a jolloff, you know, word, I and mean, it's not good enough, so it's really a Congolese word uh, that informs about the... Um, the, the fact that if my arm is cut off and I'm a prince, then the rest of my people are cut off. So any form of slavery is cutting me off. Uh, and it's ironic, and it's been written right there across the street from Congo Square. And it's also, um, you know, there's a huge Congolese uh, cemetery right there. And that name, Kuanga, comes up again in James Bond. <laughs> but one of the main films is Kuanga. So, in James Bond's movie that's shot here in New Isn't Orleans. Let, doesn't that die? Let me let that. And so the character in there also becomes this voodoo god. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's a whole thing. They, they're using all kinds of parts from that film. And it, and he's like a Brock Coupe character. They think he's dead and they go follow him. They find him and he rises up out of the ground. They shoot him. He, Runs off anyway. It's the whole thing is is lined up that way. So those, they're using those names in the thought process. But yeah, he's a super lover. Mm -hmm. And the other stories, you know, it's all about love. Mm -hmm. Any kids or all? Um, I mean, well, like Sidney Bechet would say yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. You know, he, he gets his tragic end in, in some cases, and uh, there's a uh, yeah, his, his uh, partner is pregnant. And one of the stories also, that's right. like she's pregnant, and that's why, you know, things happen the way she gets killed by an Irishman out on Bayou St. John, and uh, you know, for stealing some bananas, which is kind of like crossing the line in some kind of ways. It's you, it kind of gets lost a little bit, and who would own that grocery store and be selling bananas and things like that? But you know. There's all sorts of social reasons why they're changing that stuff, I think, also. You know, Cable has changed the story three or four times, but nobody wants to read it because he's, he's looking at the social strata in New Orleans, and they all turn it out. He has to keep working. It, it is interesting when it becomes, like, when it goes into literature, as you're saying, with Cable and, um, and some other people, one of the first things people often do is invent a love plot. You know, which is, so if you look at the newspapers, they don't talk about these things. But it's, I think you can manage identification that way, right? You know, like so. Those are stories that are trying to cultivate yeah. empathy, you know, and identification. And I think if you have if you have a lover, and, and there's some ways, as yeah, Bruce was just describing, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, where the system of slavery is getting in its way, that's a way to you know to both have identification with the character, but also identification with the cause of anti-slavery. And so um, makes some sense that um, love plots. Um, kind of um, emerge in, in literature so consistently. Yeah, it softens the brutality and then adds a, a reason that someone would have draped a man in. You call The man in back raises his hand first. <laughs> quick question. In that timeline from January 1836 to July 1837, at what point um, is he turned from an individual named Squire to this legend? Like at what point does he get that, that public persona that goes on? 
Yeah, I, I don't actually know exactly. You know, that's something I can't pin to a date. You know, um, so he's still, he's still, and even if you look at the like the newspaper articles of 1837, they actually talk. They say he's squire. He's known as Prokopi, the brigand of the swamp. And so it happens at some point. You while know, he's still alive, yeah, while he's still alive, he's he's. So those news, the newspapers say both names, squire. Crop will pay the brigand of the swamp, but when exactly it happens? It happens, I would say, pretty early on, um, you know, as, as his career is, is unfolding. Do you? Uh, it, it seems like when he when he goes to run Marbenas, when he jumps out the window and runs away, the B, I think. Yeah. The newspaper, the New Orleans B, the B, uh, they start calling him that, but he shows up in city records continuously acquired because that's who he is to his owner and how the city's going to handle it. But he, he, he's, you know, he jumps out that window and disappears after having his arm cut off. They know they're dealing with a man. <laughs> so it's like, then you know, there's a reason they call him that and, and they write some, I think they, it's, the, it's that newspaper, which was like the main newspaper, and, and they're competing with the Picayune. Uh, they, you know, they write an article that gets out there and the Picayune kind of you know, it's like how they're going to make their first big money is to start writing about this as well. So, you know, syndications run like wildfire and they, yeah. they take things. They may not necessarily read it or analyze it, they just analyze the part about making the sale because it's got to hit the front page. Yeah, that main article in 1837 is your, it's a really important point about syndication. It gets published all over the place. So, this yeah, is really a national ball, 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 story. All over. Goes yeah. to Europe. Yeah. It's, it's not the South. That um, uh, the the story from the abolitionist press I, I put up there very quickly is also very interesting too because the Picayune responded to that and they like, went back and forth and eventually the Picayune editor tried to resolve the debate uh, um, by um, uh, saying that the editor of the Human Rights should come and have a duel. <laughs> yes, come to New Orleans. And that's some that's some old school New Orleans stuff because the yeah. abolitionist paper is like sympathizing with Brian Coupe and saying this is exactly why slavery and this kind of brutality needs to end down there. Um, and yeah, the, you know, they're like, you don't know anything about slavery and how we live down here, but the best way to sell it is come to New Orleans and let's have a duel. <laughs> I tried, I mean, I tried to get everything I could, you know, um, there's some things we don't have, like wanted posters, you know, they're more ephemeral. Um, you know, this book is really a documentary history, so you actually get to see, I reproduce the actual documents. So I, I felt like that was, I was thinking about writing a kind of more narrative history, but like I felt like actually getting the primary materials in people's hands might be the most compelling way to do this. And so um, I tried, you know, I tried to get everything I could, you know, and so um, the, you get the actual text as well, how they're describing things. Um, some of it, though, you know, it's being described in retrospect. Those summary articles after he, he dies um, are, are maybe this, the, the most important journalistic sources we have. I mean, it was often page three that got the city news, you know, and so like he he was often he was appear it was it was it was put put in there. Uh, so he wasn't. It was, I, I like to think about it, you know, as being like splashed across the headlines. But I but uh, but no, it was more like kind of in the where you were reporting on courts and stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, it means he's controlling the whole system. That's a yeah. You know, it's very much a white system. But in New Orleans, you know, a lot of people read newspapers. There's also some of the first, you know. Newspapers uh, that are coming up that are like alternatives. There's yeah. Lots of them. Um, yeah, there's a the Cusack Files has 27 New Orleans newspapers. Um, I have a question about the, the metaphor that Cable uses as the arm getting removed from Africa, which I think is a really neat. Kind of, I don't know how Cable came up with it. Did you find that anywhere else besides with George Washington Cable? I think he's coming up with a, a, a re, just a reason to um, justify. He's fighting back at the people who said, uh, we're not going to accept this crap because you're trying to make a superhero out of this villain. 
basically he has to deal with trying to sell a story. So he invents a Jollof where he kind of gets it tangled up. He uses both Jollof and Congolese ideas to try and describe who he is because that's the dominant uh, cultures of people that came from Africa that are here. And then he kind of settles out when he gets to this plantation and says, the overseer says, obviously this man is a prince. He says, whoa, boss, wait a minute. Look at him. He's six foot five. He's got a straight nose. He's definitely Wallow. And he's not just any kind. Look how everybody's looking at him. He's a prince. And so he's trying to jack up his value, who he is, and his analysis and all these things. So it's a, yeah, the, the plots in it are, are really good, but he invents those, those terms to, to say that it's cutting off all of Africa. And the reason that he has two arms, uh, I think is probably more like him trying to settle out and have it acceptable because he's building up several subplots to soften the blow of a superhero while making him a real magic superhero. But he also has unrequited love, as I recall, <coughs> Well, yeah, he's being tricked also. <laughs> yeah, so, he, you know, he gets the, the tragic kind of, yeah. uh, you know, the, the lady he's falling in love with has got triple plots. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, that metaphor is an amazing metaphor, right? You know, like uh, yeah. that, that Bruce brought up yeah. before. Um, you know, and he talks about, it's about, um, it encodes the truth that all slavery is maiming, right, is one thing that is said, and it also um, suggests that um, when he was taken away, when he was kidnapped um, from, from his home, that it was as if his tribe had its um, arm cut close off at its shoulder, right? So it's, it's an extraordinary metaphor, obviously, to think about, a, all slavery being maiming a relationship to Africa, but I think it becomes even wilder when you think about it as transmuting, you know, something that is already quite metaphoric, right? You know, his name Bracoupe coming from an injury he suffers at the hands of the police, right? And so taking that injury and making it into this other kind of injury is Cable's doing some extraordinary work there. Um, it's um, it's um, also the case. Oh, I just totally forgot what I was about to say. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to you. His, his Creole in the book is, is excellent, actually. Cable is, is writing some really, you know, he puts a lot of Creole phrases in there, which would have been the, the language I, of the I've day. I've heard people so. say, um, not with respect to people of color or enslavement, that to party Creole, uh, party Maron, just mm -hmm. means you went out and had a wild night. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. It's, yeah. it's, it's used like that in more modern times. It, it was just derived from that, uh, and it's used in. Yeah, it's nuance. It's many different things. Yeah. I remember what I was going to say. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say about him being a prince. You know that this. Is, so this is a literary convention. So if you go back like Afrobens or Anoko, or if you all through anti-slavery British literature of the 18th century, um, you know these these are stories of of prince and, and noble, noble people who are kidnapped and enslaved. And so very, you know, Cable's picking up a pretty heavy literary convention. When he does that, um, it would be just one one genealogy there. Not French. <laughs> no. Not French. No. I had a question. Just something that you can ask in the general context of all this. Yeah. If if the um, the train is run up the region fields up to the lake, did that change for more communities settled or things coming after them? Do they just sort of even go across the lake or you know like by the area? I think they're probably moving constantly because you can't stay in the same place if the police is after you all the time. And, you know, it's not the first time it's happened. It just shows the um, sort of the stability of what has gone on in New Orleans for already 100 years prior to that. Like, it's a part of the system. Um, so it, it's, it's like, a, it's a reason that People were there, you know, 100 years earlier, um, you know, you had some other, you know, 75 years earlier, you had characters that were doing the same thing. And, uh, you know, in the earliest records of New Orleans, 1728, 1732, they're talking about all the maroon communities that are around the city and, you know, other large characters like San Malo. I, I was going to ask Bruce, if you, could you say something about San Malo? I think it's an important context. Right? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, um, you know, Juan Saint Malo is uh, one of the earlier famous maroons that uh, gets the same treatment as Bracupe. Uh, he's, he's got a big maroon village out 
New Orleans, the East End, uh, St. Bernard Parish uh, in the 1760s. And it's, it's there, probably the, the one that they kind of think has been there the longest, you know, like 20 years practically, or 20 plus years. And it's a, it's a big encampment of, of people that are living out there. And the Spanish government does the same thing. That's why they know so well, like, what, how they're going to try and go after this. They have to write letters back and forth to Havana and get permission to go after these people who have uh, you know, freed themselves. And, and you know, San Malo is eventually captured and brought in New Orleans on June the 19th, uh, 1784, and hung and quartered. And they leave the bodies up on spikes for a month in front of the church to. You know, put the fear in the people. But people are not scared. They're like, that's my hero. Mm -hmm. Like if there's a, a, a you know a saint in town, it's this one right here in front of the church. Yeah, in, in the same location. It's probably like yeah, the same place. Yeah, it's yeah. the same place. It's, yeah, that's the other part. <laughs> they use the same waterway system using Bayou St. John, Bayou Gentilly, Bayou Bienvenue. And these are all the places uh, right up uh, that kind of split off from where the Libertarian market is. Uh, so there, uh, which would be, uh, you know, the house of I am, <laughs> right there, you know. Uh, so they, they're using that prolifically, but it's also been used uh, as a Native American trading post. So all of this is going on simultaneously. Anybody who lives, who doesn't have a bunch of money is making their hustle in these places. Uh, and that's including, um, you know, Irish people when they come here, Sicilians, they all, they're all on the hustle because they're not really uh, white, they're not Spanish and French, they're other. So the petite blanc, the, the little white people have to use that system prolifically. Otherwise, they're just doing the same things. They're caught up in it. They have to dig the canal. They're basically enslaved in servitude in a, in a not the same way, of course, because they don't get these same harsh treatments, but, but they're having to do their work to, to uh, build a city up. So if we were to look for him in music, where where did we find the music? Rock Coupe? Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen a whole lot of it, but y'all can help me sing this, this little song here. Because, uh, you know, I've written some songs for San Malo and some other freedom fighters, like uh, uh, like the story of the Brie Creole, which was a uh, and there are stories all over this country like that. So there's a story about the Great Creole in Madison, Washington, who, who was one of those people who also, um, three years after Brock Coupe is captured, uh, he's on a ship trying to get his family, and that's on a ship that's selling from Virginia to New Orleans, bringing a load of enslaved people, 135 people, him and some other men overthrow the ship, take it to uh, Nassau, where the British Crown has already abolished slavery and in competition with the U.S. And, you know, they actually sue the United States government and win their freedom. So it was one of the first cases that, and the only one, where enslaved people sued the government, won because they got Queen Victoria to back them after sitting in jail for, you know, a year. And, and this is where, and why liability insurance is so how the United States government countersues and said, we lost our property. And the queen was like, pay up, shit. <laughs> My point is, you're not going to be bringing transatlantic cargo across the, uh, you know, the waters that I control. Basically. So, and, and you've got a great song about Madison, Washington. You, you also have a Brock Coupe song? Well, you know, I'm working on it. So y'all okay. help me sing it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think the Brock Coupe, it comes up in the era when a lot is going on in New Orleans, and there are counter narratives, and people always push them back, uh, especially folks like the, with the reasoning around Carnival. So, you know, I'm in a Skull and Bone gang. I'm the chief of the Skull and Bone gang. So, in the history of, and it's an oral history, but our history says that this happened with some old cat who came to New Orleans and started masking as a skeleton in 1819. So, so the refrain is Brock Coupe. It's easy, right? <laughs> we can sing it together. Brock Coupe, Brock Coupe, Brock Coupe, Brock Coupe. He joined the Bone Gang. He joined the Bone Gang. Long time ago, lost the Congo. Brock Coupe, run from the river. Ran to 
displayed um, at various galleries in Chicago, at Princeton. Um, it's, um, Damone Malosa is just a, such an extraordinary bead worker. You yeah, know, and, bead worker. Yeah, he's, he's really amazing. And he chooses uh, figures from history um, to commemorate. Um, it's, he's on Haile Selassie, he's on other people as well. I don't actually know the location of the suit right now. I do know that it, it is a case where um, it's being recognized as fine art. Sure. $6,000 That's a lot of money. I mean, how much is that today? Yeah, that's a, it, was, it was a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, was, there, was the payoff $6,000 or two fifty? dollars It was, it was, it was $6,000. I, 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 I might have misremembered. Yeah, you had the thing where... There, there may be a, a, there's some stories of a spoof where when Francisco Garcia goes to collect a reward, the treasurer only pays him $250. That's right, uh, but it's, no, so it doesn't say here, it just says the date, it doesn't say the amount. But he is, he is disappointed, I'm trying to remember, I, I can't remember personally which, which one it is. Well, you can check it, but I think it's, it's 250 piastres, hmm. which was the... The guy that waxed him, was he uh, a slave or a free man of color? Um, uh, I, I think this guy is like living out in the woods and he's, he's, he's free and he has the ability to... Um, because he knows Brock Coupe has some familiarity, he's able to uh, slip the rollers on him, so to speak. He, he, he gets up to him where he can, uh, where he's relaxed and he kills him. So there's all kinds of speculation, I guess, that he was asleep. And in some of the stories, he was, he was sleeping. In the road story, he's, he's asleep and he, uh, he comes into town, he's trading goods and fish and stuff like that. And he sees the, the, he sees the poster for a reward on him for 6,000. He's like, damn. Yeah. That's a lot of money. This will solve all my problems. So when he goes back out to the space where he's at, he, uh, he, he kills him with a crowbar, which is, you know, really what happened in, in, in real life also. And there, you know, and so in the different stories, you know, Cable Story and, and um, you know, like he goes out, he sneaks up on him, gets out to his camp where he's uh, living at because he's very particular and he only comes out at night to trade goods with him, you know, and uh, so this cat, he catches the guy also uh, trying to sneak up on him and he, he shoots his gun at first and, and he didn't know it but because he was crawling through the, the uh, swamps in the marsh, the, the ball falls out the gun and only the cap goes pop like that. So somehow Brock Coupe does not kill him. He just yeah, knocks him down, makes him get back in his boat, and he leaves, but he doesn't really leave. He, he comes back, um, you know, before the crack of dawn, and he finds his cap and he kills him while he's asleep. So, as always, the jewels in, in the house. Uh, just like through the angles of history, that's, uh, yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> it happens with some models, and similar. 
like insiders, it's the divide and conquer, and, and money is it's like the downfall of all these situations. Great. I think we can, I think we can close. Yeah. Great. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank you.